Napoleon like anyone can even know that. Hi friends, so this is part two of a two-part lesson on enumeration. In the previous video I covered domain enumeration and in this video I'll be covering host enumeration. Note that the previous video contained a lot of contextually relevant information that you really need to watch to fully understand why we're doing what we're doing today. So if you haven't yet watched that one, I really encourage you to go and watch that one first and then return to this one. I'll put the card up right now and as well I'll put the link right at the top of the description. So host enumeration, am I right? <laughs> so as I said before, we can broadly bifurcate enumeration into two categories, domain enumeration and host enumeration. So while the former focuses more on getting information about the network layout and the organizational structure, with host enumeration, we're more interested in information pertaining to the specific hosts, both those that we're on, as well as other hosts on the network. So why are we interested in host enumeration? What do we hope to learn? Well, allow me to provide two illustratory examples. First, we might, for example, want to learn more of the host we're on, because let's say we just got in a host, and one of the first things we want to do always is to create a sense of persistence. Our connection to any host we land on is initially typically like a ephemeral tether, and we really want to concretize it to ensure persistent, meaning that if the system shuts down for any reason or anything like that, we're able to re-establish our connection. So let's say we get on a system and we want to, for example, modify a startup service, but to do so we need to have elevated privileges. Well, in a case like this, if we can, for example, elevate our privileges, it will allow us to modify a startup service and therefore create a sense of persistence. In other words, host information can help us create persistence. Additionally, when we land on a network, we typically want to get on some of the other systems. Perhaps some of the other systems contain valuable assets, or they can provide a stepping stone or a springboard for us to ultimately achieve our goals. In any case, if we want to laterally move to another host, we certainly need some information about that host. So these are just two simple examples. There are really many, but what I'm trying to communicate here is as simple and unsexy as enumeration seems, it literally is the prima materia or the foundation from which almost all our other red team activities will depend on. In any case, I think that's just the right amount of theory to get us going. So enough with all this dilly-dallying and let's get to it. All right, friends. So let's just quickly ground ourselves here, familiarize ourselves with our surroundings and all. As you can see here is the domain controller and here is the station. That's the workstation connected to the domain controller. And that's again our de facto victim in this scenario. And then we have our Kali system. So the entire lesson will be from the vantage point of our console on Kali. So for now, I will just go ahead and full screen. So you can see here that we already have a interpreter shell. And that's because we're picking up where we left off after we've already exploited the target system and have a session or a C2 connection established. I also just briefly want to mention in the previous lesson with domain enumeration, we kind of followed two paths. We used both specialized scripts and we used a living off the land approach whereby we only used built in commands. Now in domain enumeration, we won't be using any specialized scripts. Instead, we'll only be taking a living off the lands approach. And so the first thing we'll do is we'll just write shell and that's just going to give us a command prompt shell. And so everything we're about to do with regard to host enumeration will be from the vantage point of this command prompt shell we have right now. So the first command we'll run is system info. I'm not going to go through all this right now. Please, I encourage you to do it by yourself. But you will see that basically here, there is a lot of good high level info about the system and about the operating system. And a lot of this info is useful to us because we could, you know, maybe potentially identify vulnerabilities, but it also really just helps give us a very high level overview so that we un understand our specific environment better. And then so here on forward, this information can really just help us tailor our attacks, right? So the next command we'll run is net user. A net user just lists all the user accounts on this Windows system. So there we can see we have five accounts basically. And this is obviously useful for us to identify potential target accounts that we might want to brute force or social engineer, etc. 
But of course, in most situations, what we might be even more interested in than just the other users on the same system are the local administrators. So with net local group administrators, we can run that. And now we can see that on this system, we basically have three administrators, administrator, the domain admins, and then victim. And then finally, in terms of accounts, I really want to show you who am I forward slash all. And this command shows a lot of the user account details. We can see here also the SID. And now the SID could potentially be very useful to us because we can combine it with other information to potentially get a golden ticket. Beyond the SID, we can also see a whole variety of info related to group memberships. And then if we scroll down even further, right at the bottom here, we'll see information related to privilege level. This next command is a useful command and it's a wmic command. I'm not going to read the whole thing out, but please take a moment and maybe write it down or screen capture it. And here we can see a list of all the running services. And now we know all these services are running. Of course, it's telling us the state right here in this right hand column. But of course, in our command, we specifically stated we only want to see running services. Another thing we're interested in is the start mode. We can see manual and automatic. And even though manual services can also have value, right now we're really interested in services that will start up automatically. And this is of course because these are great targets to help us create a sense of persistence. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, given the amount of different services that have automatic startup, how would we know which one to target? Well, now this is a whole world in and of itself, and we certainly will in the future do an entire lesson. So I'm not going to dive into it right now, but just as a very simple example, you know, we might look at a third party tool, for example, here, VM tools, and we might then run an SC command, which will tell us the full path of the binary. And once we have that, we could potentially use another tool or we could use a PowerShell function to then determine the version of VM tools. And of course, for us as an attacker, we always want to know the specific version of services and processes because we want to know whether or not they're potentially vulnerable to exploits. Right, so moving on, whereas that command showed us startup services, we can also run the following command to show us startup programs or processes. And here we can see four processes that will start each time the current user logs in. This command is also quite useful because as you can see, it already gives us the path of the binary. And once again, there are further things we can do to find out the exact versions to figure out whether or not it is potentially vulnerable. So again, just to recap, the previous wmic command showed us startup services, while this one showed us startup programs. Now there are some differences between the two, but it mostly boils down to them being both great targets for persistence, seeing that they both automatically start up after, let's say, for example, the system restarted. Now we're going to move away from services and processes and focus a little bit more on network connections. Great. So then let's run the actual command. Okay, so here we can see the output. So a lot of you may already know a very similar command to this, netstat naob. It's a very popular kind of built-in command. We can often use it to, for example, do some rudimentary threat hunting because it shows all the current connections to the system, right? So typically we like the naob because the b will also tell us the exact process that's responsible for mediating the connection, right? Uh, so unfortunately here we cannot run b and the reason is simply to add b we would need administrator privileges and right now since we're simulating a scenario where we just got on the box we're going to assume that we just have ordinary user permissions and not administrative permissions. But the good news is obviously we can see right here that it does give us the PID. And because it gives us the PID, we can actually just use another command taskless and we can actually ultimately find out which process is responsible for each connection. So just as a simple example, if we scroll down here, for example, we can see 5364. So let's just assume we want to know what is the exact process behind 5364. So we can just write taskless forward slash if I PID equals five, three, six, four. And then we can see it's svchost.exe. Great. 
So ultimately using this command and in combination with Tasklist, we can learn exactly which network ports are open, which services are currently connected to the network and are potentially vulnerable to attack, right? So another very useful, though perhaps somewhat limiting command is the following, wmic product get name version. And you can see here, this is really great because it gives us software as well as the version number immediately, which we can then obviously cross-reference to see if it's vulnerable. But at the same time, we only see six entries and we have to assume there's more software on the system than that. And the reason is because the only software that's listed here is the software that was installed using the Windows installer specifically. So again, this is great because it immediately gives us version numbers. At the same time, the scope is obviously quite limited. Now, second to last is a very useful command and it will actually show a lot of info we've perhaps already seen. But at the same time, I find this command very handy because it's kind of a good consolidation of detailed process information. And this includes service names and session numbers. And so this is really great because as we can see here, it gives us the the service or process names, it gives us the PIDs, session numbers, status, as well as the user running it. So again, a very handy command that gives us a really good high level idea of the processes and services running on the system. And then our final command, let's say that here in this list, we actually see a process, let's say here, for example, msedge.exe, and we're interested to learn more about it. Specifically, we want to know the executable path now, before I showed you how to use the SC command specifically to see the path for services, but since we're now dealing with a process, we'll use wmic to get this path. And so I'll run the following command, wmic process, where name, obviously there we specify the name, msh.exe, and we want the name, the PID, as well as the executable path. And we can see here it neatly gives us the information, and we can also see actually that there's multiple instances of Edge running. Right guys, so that's it. Sometimes with these videos that focus on enumeration, it kind of feels a little strange because we're just rushing through a bunch of information without digging into it. But I still think it's important just to have a video to give you a high level overview of some of the information we're interested in, as well as some of the commands we'd run to obtain this information. Now don't worry, you're not supposed to sit here and memorize them, although probably if you created a cheat sheet for yourself, that could come in handy. But in the future, we'll revisit all these commands and that'll be our departure point to then go on and use that information to achieve something specifically. So by doing that and following along in the future like that, that's really where a lot of this information and commands will solidify for you through experience. All right, friends, I sincerely hope you enjoy that. Please join me in the next lesson, which I'll publish shortly which will learn a whole host of important local and remote commands we typically want to run as part of any C2 endeavor. And you don't need me to tell you, but it will obviously be awesome. But until then, peace out.